Bacterial taxonomy is ever evolving. And as we learn more about organisms of relevance to veterinary medicine, sometimes the names change. In today's lecture, we're gonna be talking about Histophilus and Glacerella, two genera that used to be considered Haemophilus. Both of these genera are gram-negative coccobacilli and are biocontainment level two. They're facultatively anaerobic bacteria, so they can grow under anaerobic conditions. And they're a little bit fastidious. They require nutritious media in order to grow. Glacerella is quite a new genus. Um, it was recognized as distinct from Haemophilus in 2020 when uh, Haemophilus parasuus was reclassified as Glacerella parasuus. Histophilus somni used to be called Haemophilus somnus. And so if you get into any of the older literature or references, or in the case of Glacerella, even the not so old ones, beware of outdated taxonomy. Here you can see a pure culture of Histophilus somni on chocolate agar. Again, chocolate agar does not actually contain chocolate. It's actually lysed red blood cells. And in this image, you can see a pure culture of Histophilus somni. Um, again, gram-negative rods, they're often short and coccobacillary. You can see they're somewhat pleomorphic in this image here. These are host-associated uh, bacteria. They're part of the normal microbiota. Histophilus somni, we tend to associate with the respiratory and reproductive tract of particularly cattle. Glacerella parasuis is really primarily associated with pigs. Um, it's an organism that's an early colonizer of the respiratory tract, and we also find it on mucous membranes and in the lower genital tract. Haemophilus, the genus which used to include the organisms we're talking about today, includes 14 species. Histophilus so far only has Histophilus somni, while Glacerella has two species, of which Parasuus is the most clinically relevant. These organisms can be differentiated from each other by the requirements for factors X and V. So Histophilus somni does not require either of these. While our uh, Haemophilus and Glacerella species do require either or both of factor X and V. Glacerella parasuis, for instance, requires factor V, which is NAD. We did talk about this briefly in a previous lecture, but just to reiterate, um, factor X is hemin. Uh, this is a heat stable compound that's found in adequate amounts in blood agar for most organisms, while factor V is NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and this is found within red blood cells. For that reason, when we use chocolate agar and have lysed red blood cells, that factor V is liberated from them. But the requirement for an organism to have factor X or factor V supplemented can be really useful diagnostically. Um, you can see in this image here, we have a, an agar plate with discs containing factor X, V, and X plus V, and we're able to identify organisms which are off oxytrophic for either or both of these. So the bacteria sort of growing on this plate is only growing in the presence of both compounds. Either factor V or factor X on its own is not sufficient for growth. We previously talked about uh, the phenomenon of satellitism. So we have Staphylococcus aureus, which produces factor V, and the growth of organisms, which are factor V oxytrophs, growing in the direct vicinity of Staph aureus, but not beyond that. So another uh, sort of low-tech solution for identifying factor V oxytrophy. Virulence factors for these organisms are not very well defined. Um, these are species which are really primarily important to veterinary medicine, and so we just don't have the same level of research as we would for a human pathogen. For Glacerella parasuis, um, it produces a capsule, which is important in adhesion and invasion. Um, fimbrae as well, which has an association with encapsulated strains. They produce lipooligosaccharide, so LOS, as opposed to LPS, which is common in other gram negatives. And Glacerella parasuis is also capable of phase variation. So we can get the organism expressing different antigens, which is useful in uh, trying to evade the immune system. So we perhaps get antibodies to one particular antigen, and it shifts its uh, expression so that it's no longer recognized. 
Glossarella parasuis also has this very creative mode of getting into the body and into the cells. Um, it induces a process called autophagy, where a cell will eat itself. It's called self-eating, um, and that really helps it to invade. And then finally, I should say that we do have strain variation in virulence. So all Glossarella parasuis are not created equal in terms of their ability to cause disease. The two main organisms that we're going to talk about today are Histophilus somni and Glossarella parasuis, which cause in cattle Histophilus somni thromboembolic disease and also respiratory tract infections. And then Glossarella parasuis causes Glasser's disease, arthritis, and septicemia in pigs. For kind of completeness sake, I'm also briefly going to mention some of our Haemophilus species, which cause disease in people. So Haemophilus influenza, which causes respiratory tract infections and meningitis, and uh, Haemophilus ducreae, which causes a sexually transmitted infection in people called chancroid. If we compare the types of infections associated with Histophilus, with Haemophilus and Glacerella, um, there's a hint in the name that gives you some idea of where we tend to see disease. So within the name, we have histos, meaning tissue, and phyllis, meaning love. Um, so this is an organism that tends to cause tissue infections. Haemophilus, on the other hand, heme, meaning blood, and again, phyllis, meaning to love. These are organisms that we tend to associate with more bloodstream infections. If we get into the specific uh, bugs today, histophilus somni, um, these infections oftentimes involve more than one organ system. We can see it as a component of shipping fever or the bovine respiratory disease complex. In affected animals, we'll see fever, tachypnea, cough, and nasal discharge. These infections can be really painful. There's pain associated with pleuritis. In these images on the right, uh, you can see the lungs of a two-year-old cow with pneumonia caused by histophilus somni. And you can see that the lungs are really congested with these multifocal areas of necrosis. So very, very abnormal. We can also see thromboembolic meningoencephalitis. So on this section here, you can see thromboembolic disease in the brain, this large area of necrosis. And I think you can probably appreciate other foci of reddening, darkening, and perhaps necrotic tissue as well. We can see septicemia, myocarditis, which would be associated with sudden death, abortion, arthritis, and enzootic calf pneumonia as well. The lesions that we associate with histophilus somni um, are related to vascular thrombosis. So we get tissue infarction plus necrosis with hemorrhages, and this can occur, as we've just seen, really anywhere in the body, the brain, the heart, the spinal cord, kidney, intestine. And then the clinical signs associated with these lesions are really related to the site of thrombosis. So for instance, thrombotic meningoencephalitis, which we see in older calves and yearlings, um, as an issue going on in the brain, we tend to see neurological signs. So depression, fever, blindness, coma, and sudden death. Histophilus infections in cattle are treated with antimicrobials, and we also have vaccines available um, to help with prophylaxis. Disease is also seen in our small ruminants, so in sheep. Broadly speaking, we see a similar spectrum of pathologies in these animals. Lameness, septicemia, we can see reproductive issues like epididymitis and orchitis, metritis, abortion, um, and also mastitis. In this image here, I think you get a, a really good feeling for the breadth of lesions and infections associated with histophilus somni. Now, this happens to be in sheep, but we could see similar things in cattle as well. So in our, our first image here, A, uh, we have uh, multifocal necrotizing myocarditis. So there's this large lesion in the wall of the right ventricle here. We also have perhaps some other necrotic lesions uh, throughout the ventricle. In B, we have fibrinous bronchopneumonia with abscesses here, here. In this picture here, we have uh, petechial hemorrhages of the heart. In D, you can see uh, congested meningeal vessels and uh, obvious involvement of the central nervous system. And then finally, on the far right, you can see respiratory tract infections. So here we have uh, adhesions of the lung to the body wall and a severe uh, fibrinous bronchopneumonia with even abscesses. Mm -hmm.